Welcome to the inaugural show of Amplified here on BNC. I am Aisha Mills, your host, and I am so excited to bring you a show about the power and agency of black and brown people. You know, we have spent the last several years uh, in lockdown, I feel like, in this Trump era hot mess of white nationalism and frankly evil that's been permeating this country. And as somebody who lived and thrived during the Obama era professionally, I miss that energy and the spirit of hope uh, and the spirit of, you know, us being being able to win because we knew that we could win. And so what I want to do with this show is that I'm going to amplify all the activists and the advocates that are doing amazing work around this country to build power for black, for black people. I'm also going to amplify the politics and the policies that are impacting our lives. And we are going to diagnose problems for sure. But at the end of the day, we are going to remind ourselves that we are actually the rising majority in this country and that we have power and we are going to exercise that power. And so tonight, we're going to start by setting the record straight on the future of race in America. In August, census data revealed that for the first time in U.S. history, the white population declined. You heard me right. The white population is declining, y'all. Demographers have predicted this for decades and anticipate that people of color will make up a majority of the population in as early as 2042. So that's, this is where we are. We are no longer going to be the majority or the minority in this country. So here's what I need everybody to do. I need us to please stop using the term majority minority. Just throw it out of your lexicon because we are the majority. We are here, period. And I got to say that it's no coincidence that this rise of a new American majority is being met with harsh anti-democratic measures that are rolling out all across this country. White folks are boxing us out of the political system and trying to barricade themselves in to hold on to as much power as they possibly can. Joining me now to discuss all of this is professor of history, race, and public policy at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard, Khalil Gibran Muhammad. Khalil, thank you so much for being my first guest. I am amped to have oh. you. Yes, yes, it's a real pleasure, Aisha. Congratulations <laughs> on the new show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, there has been so much political unrest over the last few years. And generally, we're just thinking, oh, black people marching in the streets for our rights. Actually, it's been crazy because white folks are acting a complete and utter fool. Even though our numbers as people of color are growing, what we know for it to be true is that there's a white male minority real, rule that is still pervading our society. So white men are still ruling, even though they're the minority. The last time I actually checked, only 30% of the population was white men, but they're holding about 62% of the elected offices. So just open up by telling us, why are they so mad? <laughs> well, I think you've already set the table for uh, understanding at least that, uh, to some degree, demographics do matter in our electoral society, meaning that uh, numbers matter in terms of who gets voted. This is why so much energy is now focused on voter suppression. This is why uh, there's so many controversies around the country around the illegality of gerrymandering districts. Uh, to the extent that one might predict that with a more diverse population uh, where the majority who are people of color will vote uh, for different distribution of power, of opportunity. Uh, these are the reasons why one could reasonably speculate as to what a lot of these anxieties are about. Mm -hmm. So, look, I, I look at this uh, demographic shift that we're experiencing and personally feel really hopeful. I see possibility here. And I really do believe that we can finally shift the power in this country as people of color become the majority. Am I just being naive? What do these demographics that are changing actually say about our destiny as black and brown people? Yeah, I, I love the enthusiasm. I love the premise of this show. I am with you on optimism and aspiration, but demography is in destiny uh, and hasn't been for a long time. Uh, look, Europe is a, a small part of the world and has dominated for the better part of the last 500 years. So the fact of the United States itself as one of the most substantial places where Europeans came and settled 
as they colonized indigenous people and then imported uh, people of African descent, suggests that this has never really been about simple fact of demographics. Across the former Confederacy, there were numerous counties and states where black people were either a majority at the county or parish level, or in places like South Carolina for a time, were the majority of the population. So here's what we have to do. We have to recognize that, yes, this is another inflection point, this is another moment of possibility, but it doesn't guarantee that our politics will all align. And this is why we see, particularly for the Republican Party, so much effort to essentially draw people of color, whether they are uh, Cuban Americans or blacks for Trump who we've seen prominently on display at Trump rallies over the past five years. This is what's at stake for the shifting demographics not leading to a different America. Mm, let's talk about that. And thank you so much for bringing up the Cuban Americans, because this uh, shift that we see is a massive influx, or I should say growth, in the Latino population in this country, for sure. Mm -hmm. Black folks, eh, we're about the same, right? We're, we're, pro we're probably growing a little bit, 1%, 2% here or there. But you're right. There are a, multi there's a whole lot of multi-race people that are making up what folks are calling a new American majority. Um, it's a lat Latino community, and Asians are also growing. And from a political perspective, the Democrats do a good job at creating a big tent that's inclusive. We mm -hmm. want everybody. We want queer people. We're the party of women. We want everybody, all the millennials, all the progressives, etc. But you make a really great point that just because we're black, just because we're immigrant, uh, doesn't mean that we necessarily share the same interests and issues. You're the historian here. Reach back and give us some precedent from a time that was similar to this, where groups of people who were different but did have some overlapping interests band together and it worked? Or tell us about a time when it didn't. <laughs> well, I, I give you the same moment, which actually reveals two trends. Uh, so the, the, the moment is the early 20th century. There were Asian American or Asian immigrants uh, who were recently banned in the late 19th century, but represented as a kind of significant minority population in the West. And then there were Eastern Europeans who had been coming to the nation about a million per year around the turn of the century until World War I. Many of those European immigrants were not really deemed desirable Europeans. They were all but considered a kind of race apart. Uh, the Irish were caricatured as a part of a simian race and in, in cartoons of the period really did look like monkeys and apes and were often compared to black people. The problem is that as the economic maldistribution of the nation created extreme poverty and, and, and income inequality for various working class white people, they started to look past their differences as Irish or Polish or Hungarian or Slav or German, et cetera, and they band together in a massive labor movement that also had the potential and indeed in some places recruited Mexican Americans and African Americans. This is known as the movement of the popular front. And that multiracial coalition mm. culminated in the 1930s, put a lot of pressure on the federal government that ultimately was part of the moment that produced the New Deal. But at the same time that the New Deal created this possibility, we know there were shortcomings, there was not the vigorous anti-discrimination law written into the law. Let's put that aside, though. What also happened as that multiracial labor coalition uh, ultimately grew and produced victories and those racial distinctions between various European groups began to melt away, there was also a backlash at, immig at the immigration borders. We passed a massive immigration restriction law to prevent further Italians and other undesirable Europe from coming into the country in 1924. So the country and policymakers have always been quite savvy at opening the spigot and closing the spigot when it comes to who gets to be white. And those immigrants who had come in a million at a time who had been deemed unworthy, all of a sudden, were deemed white, and they became part of America's white working classes and were often given a kind of uh, pass, a kind of get out of jail free card to bypass black people. And that's what the New Deal did in incorporating them into middle class America. So it's a very complicated hit when there are possibilities for multiracial alliance and progress, where there's oftentimes also backlash and retreat.
I want to put up this graphic. You're, you're giving me deja vu right now, just thinking about where we are today and where we were. We actually uh, have a graphic showing how the demographics are evolving in this country by race. Can we play that? Can we put that up? So when we look at this, we see, look at the Hispanic growth. What you're talking about with the United States essentially trying to create a melting pot of people melting into being white is interesting because we don't know what will happen and play out over time with the Hispanic community that right now is suffering under the hands of this harsh and nasty uh, immigration policy. But I wonder, looking at the Asian community too and thinking of all the stereotypes of you know, model minorities and, and the other language that's used around um, the Asian community, what do you anticipate is going to play out, at least in the short term, around movements, activism, and justice, given that so many of the brown people um, are suffering under the same boots, if you will, of white supremacy? Yeah, well, you, you make a good point. First of all, there's tremendous nationality diversity in the Hispanic or Latinx community, as is true for the Asian or AAPI community. Indeed, the most extreme stratification that exists amongst so-called racial groups exists within the AAPI community, with Laotian or Vietnamese community, immigrant populations as compared to uh, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean populations. We know from sociologists that there's such a thing as, as a category of, of racial identification that goes from honorary white to honorary black. And so what we can anticipate is that groups within those populations, those broader categories, will move to one pole or another. And the question is, which side will win? Will East Asians tend to uh, side with whites in this scramble for power and resources in a future quote unquote, browner America, or will the demographics mm. of people who are uh, at the end of the honorary blackness scale tip the balance uh, and create a different America based on their interest in politics? It really remains to be seen. Wow. Well, I, I look so much, uh, I look forward to tracking all of this with you, Khalil Jabbar <laughs> Muhammad. Thank you so much for being my first guest here on Amplified. <laughs> I always appreciate your time and insight, and we'll have you back soon for sure.